roots of Orthodox spirituality. A wondrous journey into Orthodoxy. Prepared and presented by Angeliki Antonaku Lekea. Hello, dear listeners. We are continuing to read from the book Spiritual Awakening, the second volume in the series Spiritual Councils by St. Paisios. Part 2 Struggle and Devoutness. One who is heedful and takes the salvation of his soul seriously, struggles, progresses, bears fruit, is nourished spiritually, and rejoices angelically. Chapter 1 The Good Fight 1 Timothy 6 verse 12 The Struggle to Sanctify the Soul My heart rejoices when I see souls who take heed and struggle in a world that has become full of little devils. Our benevolent and righteous God has bestowed upon all of us the proper gifts, for example, manliness upon men and tenderness upon women, so we may struggle and thus climb the spiritual ladder with the help of divine grace and come ever closer to Him who is our Creator. We must never forget that beside us, apart from people who can help us spiritually, we also have Christ Himself, Panagia, the Cherubim, and the Seraphim, and all the saints. Take courage then, Christ is mighty, He is almighty, and will provide His divine power for us to break the power of the evil one. Ever present and invisible, He watches over us constantly, and will strengthen us whenever we struggle humbly with a good will. We must, as far as possible, avoid the causes of sin. We must guard our senses, because it all starts from there. And if this is sometimes or even often difficult, let us at least steer away from curiosity, that is, not allow our eyes to take in sinful images, through which the devil tempts us by replaying them as cinema in our mind. If we grasp a small piece of burning coal, it will burn us. But if we roll it around in our palm for a few moments, then it won't. It is the same with sinful images. Our eyes cannot hold them when they pass by quickly, for they are simply fleeting images that cannot burn the soul. Let those who were heedless and who acquired bad habits while living in a worldly life accept uncomplainingly the war the enemy will wage against them once they have changed their ways. They must do this, however, without cultivating any evil desires. If they work hard at this, they will be purified and reach the level of pure people who have never known great sins, learned bad habits, or been sorely tempted. Also, if they learn from their previous feelings, they will make great progress. If someone has to walk through a minefield and is not familiar with the terrain, he will need to proceed with caution, otherwise he will be blown up. If, however, he is familiar with the territory, he may indeed suffer some wounds, but with the experience he already has, he will be able to advance steadily and quickly. If one is to work on one's fellow soul, one must first weed out all the thorns, its passions, and then plant virtues in their place. However, this process 
is an arduous one and requires a strong will and great patience. Yeroda, could you please tell us in practical terms how this work is done? Every day you should try to plant in your soul something spiritual, which will eject something worldly and sinful. Gradually the old self will be disclaimed, and you will be able to move freely in the spiritual realm. Replace the sinful images in your mind with holy ones. Replace songs with hymns, worldly magazines with spiritual books. If you do not break away from all that is worldly and sinful, if you do not commune with Christ, with Panagia, with the saints, with the church triumphant, and if you do not place yourself completely in the hands of God, you will not be able to acquire spiritual health. Yeroda, what is spiritual health? Spiritual health equals pure thoughts, an enlightened mind, and a purified heart that unceasingly harbors Christ and Panagia. Watchfulness over ourselves and prayer are a great help in acquiring spiritual health. Prayer is essential for the purification of the soul, and prudence is essential for the preservation of of a healthy spiritual condition. Life, of course, is no summer camp. It has joys, but also sorrows. The resurrection is always preceded by the crucifixion. The blows of life's trials are essential for the salvation of the soul, for the soul is refined through them. Just as with clothes, the more we rub them in the wash, the cleaner they become. Even with the octopus, the more it is beaten, the more it is cleaned and tenderized. And the fish, too, appears so graceful when alive and swimming in the sea, or even when displayed in the market with the scales and entrails intact. But it becomes useful only once it is cleaned and made to look less appetizing on the outside before it is broiled. It is much the same with people. When a person sheds all things secular, his scales, if you will, it may seem that he is losing life, his worldly liveliness, but in fact he is merely removing all useless matter in order to be broiled. Only then is he made useful. What helps spiritual progress? People who have been buffeted by rough winds, either because God allowed it in order to rein them in, or because of the devil's envy, are in need of much sunshine and spiritual refreshment before they can blossom and bear fruit. They are like trees that have grown bold during winter's halcyon days, only to face the cold north wind afterwards. They will need constant spring sunshine and showers for their sap to circulate again and to blossom and bear fruit. Yeroda, what must one do to make this spiritual turnaround? It takes a philotimo-filled effort with hope and trust in God. Trust in God, simplicity, and struggle with philotimo will lead to inner peace and security, and then the soul fills with hope and joy. For the athlete to be crowned with victory takes patience, philotimo, and spiritual bravery. Bravery stems from a heart filled with philotimo, and when one does something with his heart for Christ, he neither tires nor feels pain, because such suffering for Christ is a spiritual feast. Spiritual progress can be rapid with a little philotimo-filled effort and awareness of our inner self. In the meantime, the soul will be befriended by Jesus Christ, by Panagia, the angels and the saints. Study, prayer, introversion, and some peace and tranquility help a lot too. Christ helps those who are fighting the good fight that all the saints embraced in order to subdue the flesh to the spirit. Even when wounded, we must never lose our composure, but should instead ask for God's help in continuing with the struggle courageously. The Good Shepherd will hear us and rush to our aid, just as a shepherd responds to the bleating of a lamb that is lost or wounded or threatened by a wolf. 
I constantly think of those who lived a wretched life and are now struggling. I love and cherish them more than those who do not suffer from passions. Even a shepherd will be more compassionate with the injured or sickly sheep and will give it more attentive care until it gets back on its feet again. If again we struggle, are right, but do not see any progress, sometimes the following is happening. Because we have declared war on a demon, he seeks reinforcements from Satan. The most common name in sacred scripture and ecclesiastical literature denoting the leader of the fallen and malevolent spirits. So if last year we were struggling against one demon, this year we are struggling against 50, next year we'll be struggling against even more, and so forth. God does not allow us to see this so as we don't become proud. But even though we may not realize this, God continues to work in our soul when He sees our good disposition. Yet, Oda, what is wrong when someone struggles but really makes no spiritual progress? He may be proud of his struggle, but let me tell you what causes some people not to progress. While they have excellent potential, they squander their energy on insignificant things, and this drains them of the strength required for the spiritual struggle. Let us imagine, for example, that we set out to attack the enemy and prepare ourselves with all necessary weapons to confront him. He, however, fearing defeat, attempts to distract us and draws our attention elsewhere through sabotage and diversionary tactics. We then turn our attention to these attacks. We waste our energy right and left. Time passes. Munitions and supplies diminish. We provide our soldiers with old, worn-out clothing, and they begin to grumble. The end result is that all our energy is used up, and we do not really confront the enemy. This is what happens to some in their spiritual struggle. Yeroda, don't one's surroundings help in the spiritual struggle? Yes, they do, but sometimes one can live among saints and still make no progress. Was there ever a better opportunity than that given to Judas, who was always with Christ? Judas had neither humility nor a good disposition. Even after the betrayal, he did not humble himself, throwing the silver coins down with anger and pride. He hanged himself in sin. The Pharisees also acted like the devil. When they had accomplished their evil work, they told Judas, See to it yourself. Matthew 27, verses 3 to 5. God acts according to the inner condition of man. The Holy Spirit is not obstructed by anything. What I have learned is that no matter where someone may find himself, if he struggles with Philotimo, he can achieve the desired goal, the salvation of his soul. Even Lot, who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, had attained an impressive spiritual condition. Compare Genesis 19, 1 and the following. Now, whether we want it or not, we must struggle for our improvement, so the divine grace may be active in us. Real events compel us, and will continue to compel us to approach God all the more so as to have divine power to confront every situation aright and effectively. And naturally, the benevolent God will not neglect us. He will protect us. In any case, we must know that when we improve our spiritual condition, not only do we feel much better, but Christ too is pleased. Can anyone imagine the great joy experienced by Christ when He sees His children advancing? I pray that all men and women may achieve spiritual progress and be united with Christ, who is the Alpha and the Omega. When all of our life is dependent upon Him, then all things are sanctified.
spiritual study. Yeroda, what books should be read by those who are beginning their spiritual search? First, they should read the New Testament to learn the meaning of Christ, to be shaken up a little. Later, they can read the Old Testament. Do you know how hard it is when they have read nothing and yet they come to ask for help? It is like an elementary school child going to a university professor and saying, Help me. What can the professor tell him? One plus one equals two. Others again are not spiritually restless. They come and say, Father, I have no problems and I am just fine. I only drop by to see you. Man can never say that he has no problems, no concerns. He will have something. The struggle for the spiritual life never ends. Or some people come and tell me, tell us spiritual things. It is as if they went to the grocery store and said, give us some groceries. The grocer is at a loss and needs to know what they need. They need to say, I want so much sugar, so much rice, and so on. But they only say, give us groceries. It is like going to the pharmacy and saying, give us medicines without first saying what their illness is or whether or not they went to the doctor or what he advised them to do. Go figure. You see, whoever is seriously concerned over his spiritual condition knows more or less what he is lacking, and once he seeks it, he benefits. As a novice, when I read something I liked, I wrote it down so as not to forget it, and I would try to apply it to my life. I didn't read just to pass my time pleasantly. I had a spiritual restlessness, and when I could not understand something, I would ask for an explanation. I read relatively little, but I checked myself a great deal on what I read. What point am I at? What must I do? I would sit myself down and go through such a self-examination. I did not allow what I read to pass me by untaxed. Today, with so much reading, people end up like tape recorders, filling up their cassettes with superfluous matters. According to Abba Isaac, however, wisdom not based on righteous activity is a deposit of disgrace. You see, many who are interested in sports read sports magazines and newspapers while they are sitting. They may be like the fatted calf, but they still marvel at the athletes. Oh, he is marvelous, he is great, bravo. But they don't work up any sweat, and they don't lose any pounds. They read and read about athletic events, and then they go and lie down, they gain nothing. They are satisfied with the pleasure of reading. Some worldly people read newspapers, others romantic literature or an adventure novel. Still others watch a football game at the stadium and pass their time. The same thing is done by some people who read spiritual books. They may spend the whole night reading spiritual books with great intensity and be content. They take a spiritual book, sit comfortably, and begin reading. Oh, I profited from that, they say. It would be better to say, I enjoyed myself, I spent my time pleasantly. But this is not profit. We profit when we understand what we read, when we censure ourselves and discipline ourselves by applying it. What does this mean? Where do I stand in relation to this spiritual truth? What must I do now? After all, the more we learn, the more responsibility we have to live up to what we have learned. I am not saying that we should not read so that we can plead ignorance and therefore be free of responsibility. For this is a cunning deception. I am saying that we should not read merely to pass our time pleasantly. The bad thing is that if someone reads a lot and has a strong memory, he may remember many things and may even talk a lot about what he has read, and thus deceive himself into thinking that he also personally observes the many things he reads. So he has created an illusion toward himself and others. So don't be comforted by the thought that you read a lot. Instead, turn your attention to applying what you have read. Much reading alone 
will only educate you encyclopedically. Isn't that what they call it? Yes, Yaroda. The goal, however, is to be transformed in a God-centered manner. I am not aiming to be a university professor where I would need to know many things. But if I ever need something from this worldly knowledge, I can easily learn it once I have acquired the God-centered knowledge. Do you see what I mean? When one has a distraction, is it beneficial to concentrate through study? Yes, one should read a little, something very demanding, in order to warm the soul. This keeps distractions and concerns under the lid, and the mind is transposed into a divine realm. Otherwise, the mind is diverted by whatever task is preoccupying it. Yeroda, when someone is tired or upset, he usually wants to read something light and easy, a short story, or a novel perhaps, or something like that. Is there no spiritual book that is appropriate for such times? The purpose is not to forget one's worry, but to be redeemed. Such light reading does not redeem. Novels, newspapers, and television have no value in developing a spiritual life. Quite often, even some religious periodicals are damaging to Christians because they stir a foolish zealousness that leads to confusion. Take care. Do not read unnecessary things during your free time. Some reading matter is completely hollow, like a water pumpkin. It is like looking in a haystack to find a kernel of wheat. Some people say, yes, but they relax me. But how can they be relaxing, my good man, if they make you dizzy and cause your eyes to ache? It is better to rest by sleeping. You can learn much about a person's spiritual state from what he reads, one who is very worldly will probably be reading indecent magazines. One who is less worldly will read less indecent magazines and newspapers. One who is religious will read religious periodicals or contemporary religious books or patristic texts, and so on. Yeroda, which spiritual books are the most helpful? The various patristic texts which, thank God, are available by the thousands today are very helpful. One can find whatever one needs and desires in these books. They are authentic spiritual nourishment and a sure guide on the spiritual path. However, in order to be of benefit to us, they have to be read with humility and prayer. Patristic texts reveal the inner spiritual condition of the soul, much as axial tomography reveals the inner structures of the body. Each sentence of the patristic text contains a multitude of meanings, and each person can interpret them according to their own spiritual state of being. It is better to read the ancient text rather than a translation, because the translator interprets the original verse according to his own spirituality. In any case, in order to understand the writings of the fathers, one must constrain oneself, focus, and live spiritually. For the spirit of the fathers is perceived through and by the spirit only. Especially helpful are the ascetical homilies by Saint Isaac the Syrian, but they must be studied slowly so that they can be assimilated little by little as spiritual food. The Evergetinos is truly of great benefit because it gives us insight into the whole spirit of the Holy Fathers. It is a familiar anthology of ascetic and patristic sayings and incidents which were compiled by the monk Paul the Evergetinos, the founder of the famous holy monastery of the Theotokos Evergetithos, benefactress in Constantinople. It is helpful because it describes the struggles of the fathers against each and every one of the passions, and by learning how they worked on the spiritual life, the soul is greatly assisted. Also, the Synaxaria, the lives of the saints, are sacred history and very helpful, especially for young people, but they should not be read as stories. We do not need great knowledge to be devout. If we concentrate and meditate on the few things we know, our heart will be spiritually embroidered. 
One may be profoundly affected by a single hymn, while another may feel nothing, even though he may know all the hymns by heart, as he has not entered into the spiritual reality. So read the Fathers, even one or two lines a day. They are very strengthening vitamins for the soul. Let us commend ourselves and each other and all our life unto Christ our God. Dear listeners, our time is up. Thank you for listening. We will continue once again where we left off in our next show. Until then, be well. Of thine only begotten Son, with whom thou art blessed, together with thine all holy and good and life giving Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. of Orthodox Spirituality. A wondrous journey into Orthodoxy. Prepared and presented by Angeliki Antonaku Lekeak.